All right, so we've been talking about molecules derived from amino acids. We're going to talk about one molecule or set of molecules that's derived from tyrosine, and those are called thyroid hormones. Now, a major enzyme that's involved in this process is called thyroid peroxidase. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as thyroperoxidase for short, and then the abbreviation is usually TPO. The thyroid peroxidase is a modified P450, a cytochrome P450, but it's independent of a P450 reductase. And that's because all the electrons it needs are ultimately from hydrogen peroxide. Okay? Uh, this molecule, just like P450s, has a critical heme, but this time it's going to be used for activating iodide because thyroid hormones are iodinated uh, amino acids, and it also is going to generate radicals for the second part of the reaction mechanism, which is called phenol coupling. And we're going to look at the mechanism of that in this video. This enzyme thyroid peroxidase is solely expressed in the cells of the thyroid gland, which is the source of thyroid hormones, obviously. And the two main thyroid hormones that have some activity here, although T3 is the main active one, they're going to be thyroxine, which is T4, and triiodothyronine, which is T3. The 4 and the 3 indicate how many iodines there are attached to the molecule. You can see in T4 there's 4 iodines, and T3 there's only 3. Okay, and we're going to see ultimately the synthesis of, of thyroxine, or T4 and T3, um, ultimately on the biological level, and then more on the chemical level. All right, so the thyroid uh, gland has what we call follicular cells. And the follicular cells are going to be the site of thyroid hormone synthesis, along with the follicle lumen or follicular lumen. So initially what's going to happen is you're going to get the synthesis of a protein called thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin has many, many tyrosine residues attached to it. Okay, part of it is tyrosine, a large part. The thyroglobulin is going to be initially made in the follicular cell, but it's going to be exocytosed into the lumen of the follicle. Okay? Now, at the same time, we're going to have iodide, I minus the iodide anion, that's initially going to be transported from the blood, which is it's from the diet. It's going to be transported by a symporter into the follicular cell. And then it's going to be moved into the lumen. Now, this is a mistake here because this is actually what they used to think happened. They used to think it was converted to I2, or just neutral iodine, diatomic iodine. It has since been shown that is not true, and we're going to cover that on the next slide. But suffice it to say that ultimately the iodide is going to be activated, and it's specifically going to be activated by thyroperoxidase, which is enzyme 4. So initially what's going to happen is iodide is going to be activated to the hypoiodite group, um, that's the activated iodine, and it's going to be attached to tyrosine residues on thyroglobulin. If you have one tyrosine residue that has one iodide, it's termed a monoiodotyrosine, and if you attach two iodides, it's called a diiodotyrosine, and those are abbreviated MIT and DIT respectively. So initially you should have a lot of MITs and DITs. However, in step five, thyroperoxidase has another activity, and ultimately, what we're going to look at in just a minute, it's going to couple two tyrosine residues. So it's going to couple MITs and DITs. And if it couples an MIT and a DIT, you're going to get a T3, because there's three iodines there. If you couple two DITs, you're going to get a T4, because there would be a total of four iodines there. Okay? And these are, this is all while it's still attached to thyroglobulin. This all occurs out in the lumen. However, once we're done iodinating and coupling, we're then going to transport the thyroglobulin through endocytosis back into the follicle, where it's going to be combined with a lysosome and proteolyzed. Any T3 and T4 that come off of it are then put into the blood to be used as hormones. And if we still have any, any MITs or DITs left, um, then those are going to be recycled by an enzyme called a deiodinase. That's an enzyme that actually removes the iodine. Okay? And it, we're going to recycle that iodide as shown here, and then the tyrosines that are left over um, we can actually recycle those and put them back into thyroglobulin. So the follicular cells have to have a lot of tyrosine. And I mentioned in previous videos when we talked about amino acid biosynthesis, tyrosine is, it's usually labeled as a non-essential amino acid, but it really is essential. We can't make it ourselves. We can't make it de novo. We have to get it through the diet, but particularly for follicular cells in the thyroid, 
uh, having adequate tyrosine is very important. So this is sort of the big physiological uh, function of the cells that are making thyroid hormone. But now we're going to look at more of the mechanism. This is the general mechanism. Okay? In stage one, which is shown at the top, we have iodide activation. Iodide is activated by the heme cofactor to hypoiodide. This is over here where my mouse is on the right side of, this, of the picture. That is the hypoiodide shown there. Okay? And, in, and ultimately, that iodide is attached to a tyrosine, making um, an iodide linkage to the tyrosine on the, on the aromatic ring. Stage two is the phenol coupling reaction. Now I'm going to go in more detail on the mechanism here. Suffice to say, radicals are going to form on two nearby tyrosine residues that have been iodinated, and they're going to couple as shown right here. Okay, so hopefully you see that. And all of this, like we said, is occurring on tyrosines that are attached to thyroglobulins, occurring on the whole protein. So let's go ahead and look at the iodination mechanism. So we're going to start here. So this heme iron is initially going to bind hydrogen peroxide. Okay. Now the iron 3 plus is going to donate two electrons to the nearby oxygen ejecting water. But that's going to generate an iron oxo species. The iodide is going to attack this oxygen, putting those electrons back onto the iron, so it's in the 3 plus state. And now I have right here the hypoiodite species. The tyrosine is going to undergo an electrophilic aromatic substitution, in which case the benzene ring is going to be a nucleophile and attack the iodide, which is going to regenerate water, which is going to leave, and you're going to get a, an, an electrophilic aromatic substitution, which you saw in organic, and that's going to essentially add that iodide onto the ring. Okay, this would be a monoiodotyrosine, and if I added another iodide right there on my mouses, and it has to be right there, they add in specific places, they add ortho to the hydroxyl group there. If I added another one there, which would be an identical mechanism, that would be a DIT or a diiodotyrosine. So overall, the point is, the point is, is that you iodinate tyrosine while it's still attached to thyroglobulin. That's the iodination mechanism where we activate iodine. But now we're going to look at the thyroglobulin phenol coupling mechanism. So again, it's going to start off the same way. We're going to have the iron, the heme iron is going to bind hydrogen peroxide, donate two electrons, kick off water, and now we have the iron oxo species. If you need more help with the first part of this mechanism where we're looking at the activation of hydrogen peroxide and oxygen, go back to the P450 playlist and we have a whole video explaining that. Now initially what's going to happen is this oxo species is going to take an electron away from one of these tyrosines. So you see this tyrosine radical there. Now technically it's a diiodotyrosine radical, but I'm just going to call it tyrosine. But notice that there's iodides there. Um, the now hydroxyl that's um, ultimately chelated to the iron is now going to do another radical mechanism where it's going to take another electron away from the other nearby tyrosine, in which case you end up with another radical there. Okay. Now there's multiple theories about how this coupling actually occurs, whether it's a homolytic uh, radical mechanism or a heterolytic. Um, this I've shown the homolytic theory about how it works with a radical mechanism. It's really not that important, but suffice to say the radical right here is going to couple with the radical right here, and that's going to ultimately give you uh, this, which is ultimately, this would be a T3. This would be a triiodothyronine. Okay. Now also, this right here that was attached to this ring, it's now been cleaved off, but it's left with a double bond. Now this technically is a, it's basically alanine, but with a double bond. It's actually called dehydroalanine. Where alanine has a double bond right here, this is actually called dehydroalanine. So I just showed you the structure of dehydroalanine, and if we had combined two DITs, we would have T4, tetraiodothyronine, also known as thyroxin. Okay? So that was ultimately the mechanism of how we do that. This was all while it was still attached to thyroglobulin, and then we're going to ultimately get that thyroglobulin back into, into the follicular cell, and then lysosomal degradation will result in the cleavage off of any T3 and T4, which will be dumped into the blood as hormones, and then we'll recycle the DIT and MIT and the iodide that comes with those. All right. So we can, thyroid uh, function is very um, 
prone to homeostatic imbalances, particularly in the United States where our diets are terrible. And usually either one of two things happens. Either we get hyperthyroidism, where our thyroid is producing too much thyroid hormone, or hypothyroidism, where we're not producing enough thyroid hormone. And there's sort of uh, common treatments for each one, and they're all kind of dumb. They're honestly all kind of stupid, to be honest, because they don't really fix the problem. So for hyperthyroidism, the less severe of them is to use an inhibitor, which is shown here, called propylthiouracil. This is just an inhibitor of thyroid peroxidase, because if you have hyperthyroidism, that means you're making too much thyroid hormone, and you want to calm that down. So what you do is you give an inhibitor of the enzyme that actually makes thyroid hormone, and the production goes down drastically. Um, that's sort of uh, something where you have to keep taking this drug. This over here, what is that? Well, that is, we're talking about radioactive iodine. Radioactive iodine is very dangerous. It's radioactive, which means that it is prone to nuclear reactions. What you do is you give radioactive iodine as an injection. And since, in general, the thyroid gland is the only uh, type of cell that's going to intake iodine, well, it clearly intakes the iodine, and what happens once it's in there, after a certain amount of time, the radioactive iodine is under, going to undergo a nuclear reaction called beta decay. And this is showing ultimately the beta decay. It's going to occur in about eight days or so, so you don't have to worry about it uh, messing with your intestine. It's going to be in the thyroid gland when it occurs, but what's going to happen is the iodine, when it's inside the follicular cell of the thyroid, it's going to it's going to decay, release a beta particle, which ultimately causes the formation of xenon. That's not really important. The point is, when that beta decay occurs, it releases an enormous amount of photon energy, and it kills the thyroid cell, the follicular cell. So ultimately, what happens when you take radioactive iodine is it, I guess you could say short-term solution, does cure the hyperthyroidism because it actually kills your thyroid. It literally destroys it. It no longer has function. It's dead. And the thyroid doesn't regenerate itself. So pretty much once you do radioactive iodine, your thyroid's dead. Okay. One common use of that is for thyroid cancers, which I suppose is more understandable, but a lot of times it's just used for out-of-control hyperthyroidism. Um, when in general, what they really should have done was probably exercise and controlled their diet and stopped eating crap, like, like highly inflammatory foods. In fact, both hypo and hyperthyroidism, one very common cause of it, particularly both of them, is poor diet. In fact, poor diet is arguably the main cause of it. But no doctor is going to tell you to do that. They're just going to give you a drug, like propylthiouracil. Now, in the case of hypothyroidism, um, that's when your thyroid gland is not producing enough thyroid hormone. So what, you sh what the doctor will do is actually give you a supplement of actual thyroid hormone. Now, levothyroxine, um, this actually is thyroxine. This is the T4 that we saw right here. This is actually the molecule, the drug they're giving. It's one of the few drugs that you actually can take that's the actually not just some synthetic molecule. It actually is the molecule thyroid hormone, okay? It, key here, artificially raises T4 and T3 levels. However, because when you took hypothyroidism, your endocrine system was already out of whack, artificially giving this molecule does nothing for the regulation of it. And so what ends up happening is people who take this drug, level thyroxine, have a lot of problems. Um, it causes oily skin, sweating, heart palpitations, rapid weight loss. Um, which in general, it's not, this drug is actually contraindicated and not advocated for weight loss. Um, it, it basically dysregulates your endocrine system and can take over a year to recover once you stop taking the drug. It's mostly accepted by most intelligent people that you shouldn't take a drug for your thyroid problem unless it's something like cancer. If it's just any kind of out-of-whack endocrine problem, you should probably try balancing your diet and exercising. Those are the two most effective ways to uh, cure your thyroid issue. But these are just quick ways to try to balance everything, but they really don't work. And certainly radioactive iodine kills your thyroid. It won't recover. It's dead. Okay, And actually, once you take radioactive iodine, you kill the thyroid. So now you have hypothyroidism, and then you're on levothyroxine for the rest of your life. So overall, it's just a very bad thing. Um, also, uh, levothyroxine can actually induce heart problems such as AFib, uh, atrial fibrillation, and it's very hard to get rid of that once you have it. It's been established that 
levothyroxine does do that. All right, so hopefully that gives you some intuition on thyroid hormone and its synthesis and function. Um, in terms of what thyroid hormone does, we're going to cover that in another video, but suffice it to say right now, thyroid hormone overall increases the overall metabolic rate. Um, thyroid hormone, if you're if you deficient in it in hypothyroidism, you tend to be very sluggish, tired, your metabolic rate is low, you tend to gain more weight easily. And also other hormones that are released by other cells can play a role in um, the thyroid hormone synthesis. For example, it's well established that leptin, which is a hormone released by fat cells, leptin um, promotes, sati promotes satiety, meaning you're not hungry. The opposite hormone is ghrelin, which makes you hungry. But leptin, high levels of leptin, which are released when you have a lot of body fat, tend to inhibit the release of thyroid hormone. In other words, it's a vicious cycle. If you have low thyroid function, you tend to gain weight, body fat, and if you have a lot of body fat, you tend to not release a lot of thyroid hormone to begin with. So it, it's an exacerbating problem, but the way you fix it is you exercise and you eat a healthy diet. So hopefully that gave you some intuition. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.